Hey everyone, I'm here with Alex Gladstein. Alex, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's great to see you again. We haven't chatted for a while and excited to get into this today. Yeah, pleasure to come on, talk about the book and current events and all the crazy things that have happened uh, in the last 10 months or so since the last time I was on. So, right, you know, you're writing this book and you're locking it down with your publisher. How much has played out? I'm just curious, how much has played out since locking down your book in world events, uh, the, I mean, from week to week, we pretty much have like a decade's worth of things that are happening. <laughs> so when did you, when did you go to, uh, when did you submit to your publisher and when did they uh, take everything to print and like that timeline process? Yeah. So we began the editing process in maybe uh, October and we locked text in January, like kind of very end of January. Um, and you know, in the past six, seven weeks, we've seen two things happen in the world that were that that are kind of uh, progressions from the themes I was riffing on in the book. The first one, of course, relates to the fact that many of the uh, chapters in my book relate to people who use Bitcoin uh, as almost like a human rights tool where their bank accounts are frozen uh, or their activities have been restricted because of who they are. Uh, whether that be their beliefs, their ethnicity, their religion, whatever. Uh, I tried to really globe trot and, and go to different parts of the world, whether it be Latin America or uh, Africa or the Middle East, uh, Asia, to, to do that. Um, and what was most astonishing to me first was, was the Canadian government's reaction to the uh, trucker convoys fundraising. And that whole episode... Um, it was unbelievable. You know, it was an unbelievable episode, and it continues to play out. But it 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 very much um, is a growth from some of the things I was observing in the book around, for example, anti police protests in Nigeria, and you know the the Nigerian feminists getting kicked off their fintech apps and having to use BTC Pay server instead. Like that happened in the fall of 2020, and that you know totally starts to foreshadow what happens in Canada. The most shocking thing about that, of course, was that. Canada is, is regarded as like a liberal democracy, one of the most open societies in the world, and really underlined, I think, for everybody that, hey, if it could happen there, it could happen anywhere. And I think, you know, at least pre-Russia invasion of Ukraine, there was this really widespread sentiment on social media, in the Bitcoin community, in the wider cryptocurrency community of like, hey, we've been like focusing on price for the last two years, but like, this is actually what it's all about. Like, Absolutely. Pe people were like, it was kind of almost refreshing to get yeah. like a community focus on this. Like, this is what it's actually about money that the government can't control. Now, did the truckers screw up dissemination distribution? Yes. And, and, you know, we get into that, but the point is that like, and Lynn Alden had an awesome thread on this back in February, but like, essentially when you raise funds with Bitcoin, even if you screw up, the government has to like put all this work into finding you and doxing you and you know serving you in a court or whatever whereas when you raise funds with gofundme it's like a one one button click or a phone call so so even though these folks really screwed up and they used a static address and they they did a bunch of things that i think are are you know problematic a lot of the bitcoin still got spent and distributed so i mean it's it's kind of funny that like you know even when you have bad opsec it's a, just a, such a different paradigm than the legacy financial system, which is which is built for control, right? You know, Bitcoin is built for freedom, but it's nation, and you got to know what you're doing, and you can screw up. And they and these uh, this trucker sort of did screw up in some ways, um, but at the end of the day, it's not built for control. So the Canadian government still had to like do a whole bunch of stuff, and continues to have to do a whole bunch of stuff to try and work through the court system and, and try to get these guys and, and try to get this fun these funds and. As of today, they, they've only gotten a small percentage. And I just think that speaks volumes about Bitcoin's efficacy as a, as a protest uh, fundraising tool. Um, and then, and then <laughs> like uh, on the 24th of February, you know, Putin invades Ukraine. And I mean, man, this is obviously the big topic that has changed the world. It will be in history seen like the US invasion of Iraq uh, uh, or the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is like that level of importance of event for a variety of reasons. And one of the interesting things, of course, was that there was a fog of war and not a lot of people thought it was going to happen. I mean, I think there was a widespread, obvious, like focus at the time, like 
we had the Olympics in China and people were kind of like, hmm, you know, our chairman, HRF Gary Kasparov had this old joke about, well, like, what do you think happens when the enemy encircles your country? Like, what do you think happens next? And we could see it on satellite image, but, you know, people understandably were skeptical of U.S. government intelligence. You know, a lot of people, especially in the Bitcoin community, don't trust the U.S. government. And I didn't think it was going to happen. I yeah, mean, I mean, I, I, I kept was, seeing the reports. I was like, they're not going to invade. No, Ukraine. and they're, they're, yeah. it's not. And there are incredible Russian journalists who work for, like, the Guardian, New York Times, who who didn't think it was going to happen. Who who live in Russia? I mean, so it's like, who are Russian? So, you know, there was a lot of fog of war stuff going on, but ultimately, Putin invades, and then the West freezes the Russian central bank reserves, right? And and there's been some really great discussion on this, especially by by Luke Groman on them. Um, on, on, on the Grant Williams show um, and, and by other folks, but really a watershed moment. You had the memo by Zoltan at Credit Suisse come out and, you know, look, things take time, but like clearly the last eight months um, are a watershed moment in terms of understanding inside versus outside money. I mean, first you had Afghanistan, you had the fall of Kabul and you had the United States government just simply just freeze the reserves of that particular sovereign. Um and then, and then you had this and, you know, it seems like Putin probably knew this was going to happen and he had certain plans in place. Um, but for a one superpower to like, just be able to freeze another superpower savings because the other superpower chose to save in its rivals liabilities, you know, is now something that is a global discussion topic, whereas it just wasn't before. Okay. So now you're thinking about China the CCP. Okay, what happens if they invade Taiwan later this year? Well, guess what? You know, trillion dollars of their assets are going to get frozen. So they've got about one point one trillion dollars of American securities that they that they sit that they've saved, right? So I think that causes pause and hesitation. And I, the realist view, which I, which I I have a couple different hats, but I mean, obviously, I'm a human rights activist, but I'm also trying to have this realist view of monetary economics and the way the world works from that perspective, the realist view quite obviously is that over the next few years, and especially over this decade, big powers are going to diversify their their savings uh, away from the US Treasury. And, and that was the other theme that I wrote about a lot in my book um, was monetary history and how essentially we went from uh, gold as the reserve currency um, to essentially the US dollar or the US Treasury as the reserve currency and how I think eventually we're going to go to Bitcoin. And that, that, that was sort of um, a big part of a couple of the chapters in my book that tried to do a retrospective on that. So, so to come out of the book publishing process and <laughs> see just like a super vivid uh, use case, obviously for Bitcoin um, from, as like a freedom money at the micro level, and to see all these critics come out and say, I was wrong on Bitcoin, like we need it, you know, all these telegram groups I'm in with all these kind of, trad five people, they were like, oh, I mean, hey, you know, obviously, I guess we need Bitcoin. And then to see the macro effect of what I had been talking a lot about with regard to the trajectory of the dollar system start have a clearly historic milestone. And, you know, we're living in history right now, as you and I speak. So we'll see what happens, obviously. Um, but to have those two things happen right after was, was, was pretty amazing. And it, it felt like the process of writing, which which started for me in 2020, um, you know, during during early 2020, during uh, two things happened. Obviously, we had COVID, the, the sort of COVID shutdown. I was at home all the time uh, doing a lot of reading. I made a pledge to myself to learn more about the bond markets because I thought that was really kind of interesting and um, I didn't know much about it. And I spent two years learning about that. Uh, and then I started to interview people in the space that I thought were interesting. And I, I had this book project in mind. And that's when I interviewed, for example, Adam Back and, and a few other folks. Um, so I did a bulk, bulk of the research and, and, and kind of early writing in 2020. And then in 2021, I started putting things together in a series of kind of reportage for Bitcoin magazine that, that would later start to create the skeleton for the book. Um, so I really liked the way it all came together. And the cool part is some of, you know, some of the book obviously was published as, as chapters. They were later edited, you know, and, and ordered in a way that, that I think makes a narrative sense. But the cool part is a lot of those 
stories had been out there and I got so much feedback from people. So mm, I was yeah, able, I was, yeah. you know, cause like thousands and thousands yeah. of people would read the stories and a couple would say, Hey, maybe you got this wrong or whatever. So I kind of like Wikipedia or, or kind of crowdsourced some of the, uh, things that maybe I had, I had gotten wrong or whatever. And that means the book is, is pretty polished from that perspective. And I'm really happy and confident about everything that's in there. But anyway, to, to, to conclude the opening here, w- what a time to publish the book. And I mean, wow. I mean, what, what, what a time. And again, it, it reminded me of the process of writing because I had written one of my chapters is about how Bitcoin adoption works globally and uh, how sort of like this Trojan horse for freedom. And you know, I write this chapter and I'm thinking a lot about it. And then all of a sudden I see this like, uh, you know, populist leader in Central America, like uh, Bitcoin. And I was there in the crowd when Jack Mullers announced it. It was so astonishing. And um, and then just to start to see that, uh, you know, unfold um, and then to get to go down there and, and do a big piece on that, um, I thought I thought was was important. Um, but yeah, we're just we're just living history right now. And this El Salvador story continues to be important. I mean, just today we saw that the Honduran government, which which clearly had been mulling Bitcoin adoption because the central bank put out a statement about Bitcoin adoption today. Like the, the central bank of Honduras put out a statement about Bitcoin adoption today. I mean, wow. Um, so that they, they put that out and they basically said, you know, cool your ideas. Uh, we're going to do a CBDC, it, it seems. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if, again, you see some things happening in Central America, it just seems inevitable. But but for now, this new government, uh, leftist government in, in Honduras, which which I, I obviously thought would be really interesting if they, they did something with Bitcoin, because ultimately, I think leftist governments will. Um, but, uh, you know, that comes out today. And you've got the US uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you know, going after this bill that they want to pass that like basically mandates the state department and other agencies to like do a thorough investigation of El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption. And it's like, let's talk man, that, you let's, know, let's, let's get into that before we yeah. go to the book. I want to yeah, yeah. talk more about this because I read this on Twitter today and I also wanted to just comment. I think mm-hmm. uh, Twitter is the best peer review for anything that you can possibly write on the planet. The, the academic peer review process is totally dead. Just post it on Twitter and uh, you'll get real. You'll get real feedback. You might not like the tone that the feedback comes in, but you'll get real feedback. <laughs> um, okay, so this uh, this announcement, this uh, Senate plan to uh, direct the State Department to investigate El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption. This is a four page uh, document mm-hmm. that goes into a very specific definition of the. At least my interpretation of what I read was. Um, they want to fully understand the benefits and potentially uh, detriments of having a Bitcoin legal tender system in in uh, a country. Uh, what impacts that has on businesses, individuals, you name it. And then uh, the very last portion of this four page document, it said that they uh, the U.S. government wants a study conducted on what the ramifications of that might mean to the existing. Uh, dollar reserve uh, system. It's just like a maybe two sentence comment about a study on that particular topic. So this just came out today. Like, what the heck does this mean? And the the turnaround time was what ninety days or something like that, Alex? Yeah. So I, look, I I did a comment for Politico about it this morning. Um, but essentially, I, I would I would imagine you would agree that the the sort of big takeaway is like wow, the U.S. government's extremely serious about (laughs) Bitcoin adoption in Central America. Like like the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is making this a massive priority. Uh, I'm sure- Even the president president of El Salvador seemed pretty shocked based on his comment on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, he's like, hey, we're some little country. Like this is is crazy. And no doubt with the prodding of Treasury and FinCEN and and, and OFAC and all the rest. But um, look, I, I, I think that's the big takeaway is that the U.S. government's taking this extremely seriously. That's the general takeaway. But Look, I think could could we get some interesting new data from such a study? Yes, definitely. I mean, there could be another data point, okay, a U.S. government data point, which we also we should take with a grain of salt. But it'll go in there, and they will, I imagine, try to 
figure out like percentage of adoption. They'll try to suss out some of these claims that Bukele is making. It can't hurt to have another data point. So that's, that's, that's one thing. But, you know, when you read through this memo um, or this potential bill, um, it, it just strikes me that it's kind of set up to produce a negative outcome. Like it, it, it starts out by talking about how, how will this challenge uh, essentially like, you know, the, the, the travel rule type uh, financial dragnet rules that the United States has in place. Like how will this challenge the KYC AML regime and how will it challenge the World Bank and the IMF and how will it challenge the existing monetary order is essentially the questions I think they're really trying to ask. I, I don't think necessarily they're trying to figure out like, oh, is this good? And should we do that? I think obviously uh, they, they, they know where they stand on that. They don't want to do this. I think what they're trying to do is, you know, can by throwing their weight around here, maybe can they discourage other countries from doing it, right? Um, and, and you know, maybe Honduras is evidence of that. We don't know. But obviously, that government was mulling it clearly if the central bank would put out a statement. I mean, there's no reason the central bank would feel the need to put out a detailed statement about Bitcoin adoption if they hadn't been discussing it internally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe maybe the US government put some pressure there. I'm not sure. Uh, I think Kamala just, you know, went down there and, you know, th they seem pretty tight. So, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on there, but uh, could we get something interesting out of it? Maybe, but I think the big takeaway is simply that the US government's very concerned uh, that a Bitcoin model could could break the current system. And yeah, wow. You know, the, the irony for me is that the way that, that you phrase that last sentence is uh, how I think most of the world is going to perceive this, is that Bitcoin broke the old system. When in reality, the old system is, is breaking itself. And there's just this thing over here that just happens to be ready to catch all of the, the broken pieces and kind of piece it all back together. Yeah, again. no, no, no. Bitcoin's but the life raft, not the iceberg, is, right? <laughs> exactly. No, 100%. No, and I, I yeah, agree but, with that, but, of course. But I'm just, I'm, the but so vibe I got. Will. No, but I, the yeah. vibe I got from reading what they're saying is it, what I'm kind of trying to conclude here with is that yeah. the, the bill is set up for a memo or a finding that says Bitcoin's the iceberg. That's all. And even if it does, and I agree with you, and I think uh, even if it does say that and it comes back with, hey, this is really bad, everything's going to... I think the, the critical question that has to be asked when a person would read that report is, so what? What can you do to prevent that from happening or from to prevent that from evolving in that direction and do you have that authority to prevent that? And I think you and I both know the answers, or we suspect we know the answers to both of those very difficult questions that any individual company, government body is going to have to ask itself as they're trying to understand and wrap their head around this. And the answer is no, you can't. You don't have a unilateral authority to prevent this thing on a global scale for every single participant to not participate. And as long as that, what I just said, is, is a true statement, if that's a true statement, well, then you have to choose to, to participate, right? So. Yeah. And I also think that, um, look, I think it also just helps us recenter and realize how exceptional the El Salvador move was. And look, obviously, I've been very critical of Bukele taking a lot of heat on Bitcoin Twitter for being critical of Bukele, but yeah. whatever, man. I think that, you know, if, uh, if, 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 if he plays his cards right, he could do great things for his country. Um, but, you know, I went down to El Salvador with people from Venezuela and with Ecuador, from Ecuador and Nicaragua. I went with people who'd seen this movie before, you know, that, like all the telltale signs. Like when I first started working for the Human Rights Foundation in the mid 2000s, Guess what Chavez did? Well, you know, he sacked the attorney general. He restacked the Supreme Court. He changed the law so he could keep running in office. And this is like an obvious blueprint. Like we know where this is going. Now, maybe, maybe Bukele is the exception and he's doing all these things without a goal in mind. That just seems like a stretch. Um, we can hope that he doesn't take the big steps and that he, he sees the wisdom in restraint. I mean, that's the hope. He still has a way out. Um, I think that he could still be this like forever remembered figure who was the first to understand the Bitcoin standard. I mean, that this is very much in the cards, 
but he's got to cool it with the like getting rid of his rivals and cracking down on dissent. Otherwise he'll, he'll, I think he'll disrupt the legacy and he'll be more remembered for other things, unfortunately. So we'll kind of see, but just generally speaking, I think that um, it's, it's such a powerful reminder of the fact that what he did was so unique. And even though I have, again, strong criticism of what he's doing in a broader sense, politically, I did credit and even cheer the fact that he chose Bitcoin because he didn't cho- choose a CBDC. And that was remarkable. And it continues to be remarkable. Yeah, very I'll, much continue, so. I'll continue to give him credit for that. Um, and when you look at the fact that the Honduran government's kind of saying, well, maybe we're just going to go the CBDC route. Like, wow. I mean, you're talking about the difference between a monetary system of freedom versus a monetary system of control. And ironically, seven hours ago from when you and I are talking right now, the Fed, <laughs> the Fed's Twitter, the Fed, the Fed having a Twitter account, by the way, is hilarious. But OK, so the Fed tweets, why is the Federal Reserve considering a hashtag CBDC now? Uh, you know, one out of three thread. Um, what a wild statement to make on this very day. Um, and uh, with they have a graphic and everything going on. So it's like they're setting it up. You know, the Fed is going to roll out a CBDC at some point. I mean, we're hearing from Powell. We heard we heard from today that, oh, it would have to. Um, he, he's like, it's got to have privacy, but also identifiability. OK, well, that means that it's not going to have privacy. Right. You notice how they're definitely not talking about it for a peg. Right. Which. Right. Like this, the whole thing is about having a unit that is not being debased, that pegs and holds everybody to a monetary standard without debasing it and shoving it into the hands of a select few, uh, you know, group of people. So that, that's the, that's the thing that I think so few get when you get into this, the CBDCs is first and foremost, it has to be pegged. It has to have a fixed supply that can't be manipulated by a single point or uh, you know uh, a few people in a room, and not and no CBDC is going to do that. Yeah, they well, have to the base. Yeah, no, I, I, and look, I like to answer the Fed's question: Why is the Fed considering a CBDC now? Well, I, I have three Control. answers. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, to replace cash with a tool of surveillance. That's like uh, the writing's on the wall for that one. Um, number two, to establish limits on, on who can use dollars. I, I, you know, another big one that's kind of obvious. But number three, and, and to your point, yeah, it's to make it easier to conduct expansionary and repressive monetary policy. I mean, they can do helicopter money. They can do programmable money. You know, we've been in all these debates the last few years of like, you know, does QE cause inflation and in my latest essay, I, I tried to really break down how I thought that, that that there's just tons of evidence to show that that you know basically government intervention in the bond markets Q, QE causes massive asset inflation, and I think that's really really clear, and has all kinds of externalities, but but it doesn't necessarily cause uh, consumer price inflation. Okay, directly. However, if the Fed is now has accounts directly with Americans. Uh, this is a different ballgame. And a CBDC would basically marry the Fed's ability to do QE uh, and eat up um, you know, sovereign debt with, with, with the ability to directly credit basically bank reserves into people's pocketbooks, um, which, which, which is spending into the real economy and will be really inflationary. So we're talking about like programmable stimmies, right? So I think that this idea of CBDCs is far beyond just the sort of surveillance tech piece. Uh, I think it's 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 we have to talk about negative interest rates. We have to talk about expiration dates on money. We have to talk about the monetary piece. A hundred percent. It's essentially going to be a, a tool to disincentivize savings and to incentivize consumption and spending because that's what our economy kind of requires right now. That that's what the powers that be want. Right. The whole Greenspan. Um, Fed model that was so brilliantly described by this journalist, Christopher Leonard, in this, his new book, The Lords of Easy Money, which I definitely recommend people read, um, is that they basically said, we're going to do three things. They said this in the 90s after the early, after the recession in the early 90s. They're like, we're going to uh, fight price inflation. We're going to ignore asset inflation and we're going to bail out the economy and it crashes. I mean, that's basically the, the Greenspan playbook. And guess what? They did all those things. And and, and now they're now they're going to have to fight price inflation because that's where that's where we are. 
but I think that the CBDC just plays into the macro uh, story here in, in, in a really big way. And ultimately, one of the chapters of my book relates to, to the cypherpunks and, you know, they saw this coming. Like, like, that's what Bitcoin was invented to fight was the CBDC. I made a joke the other day about how I thought that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's this theory of Satoshi being uh, kind of like someone sent back in time from a dystopian future uh, to, to kill off the, the CBDC uh, in the same way that the Terminator was sent back, you know, um, to save John Connor so he could fight Skynet, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you kind of get the idea that like, it, it is this incepted idea that was literally nothing more than a blog post essentially on a message board that, and a little bit of code that has now grown into a not just a serious contender to a CBDC, but something I think that will help us fight and defeat it, which is really amazing. So, so, so I'm super into the, you know, this being the legacy of the cypherpunks in the 1980s, them seeing the writing on the wall, Neil Stevenson, even writing about it in his books in the eighties, knowing that like electronic control of money would lead to both surveillance and sort of that um, easy monetary policy, programmably easy monetary policy. And then, literally them designing a thing that could fight back. And that's where we are today. And we, 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 we're lucky to live in a, you know, a, 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 one of, you know, one of the many different parallel universes. We're lucky to live in one of them where Bitcoin did get invented and we do have a tool to fight back. Otherwise I wouldn't be super, super bullish uh, or, or, or optimistic about the future as I am now. Um, but anyway, really great day to talk. Lots happening. Um, you know, very, very clear that that we're about to see this battle kind of unfold, you know, e even domestically between CBDCs and and, and Bitcoin, and and you know, we'll be, we'll be here for that. I, I liked the three points that you lay out in that response to the uh, central bank because each of those three points that you make, which obviously I, I don't think anybody can even argue any of those three points, but each one of them is a breakdown in trust they lead to a breakdown in trust of the user of that CBDC because you're, you're putting optionality into the currency that can just totally usurp their, their buying power at, at, at no notice if you tick somebody off yeah, or somebody I, doesn't I, like what you're doing or whatever. I, I, and I've been following this guy. I love this guy, uh, Fed guy 12, Joseph Wang, uh, you know, writing about his experiences working as a trader at the Fed for years and years and years. And I've been noticing that he's like increasingly, I don't know, he's on like, he's on the right side here, which is really interesting. He, and he tweeted today, a CBDC is just a surveillance tool and has no place in a free society. And I'm like, hell yeah, that, that's the right take. And it's like, <laughs> that's right. Kinda, it, it's amazing that, that somebody who worked inside the beast, you know, for a decade or whatever, that's his viewpoint. Like he saw yeah. how this sausage is made and he was like, nah, we don't want this. This is not good for us. And uh, he told me that uh, I talked to him um, and I, I read a lot of his stuff in, in preparation and in re during research for a recent essay that I wrote on um, basically foreign policy and, and QE, which I think is like a very overlooked topic. But essentially, he was essentially saying something like the fact that you know, usually the bond market plays a, a is sort of a check on government power, uh, just like uh, the Senate and the and the House are a check on the executive branch, and just like the Supreme Court is a check on the executive branch. Well, the bond market's a check on on government power too, and that actually, basically through the Fed's actions, they took that check away. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I think that somebody who saw that all go down post two thousand eight. And realized like, wow, there's just like all this centralized power coming together, sees that a CBDC is just like the worst possible thing. I mean, it's like adding kerosene to the fire. I mean, yeah. it's like yeah. anything they can do now. I mean, man, if they can just program stimulus, um, it, it, you know, it'll it'll be abused. I mean, and, and Democratic politicians aren't necessarily at fault. There, there was a, a guy, um, Jack uh, Ref, um, he, he wrote a lot about gold standard and the U S moving off the gold standard in the fifties, sixties and seventies, uh, French, uh, French writer, French diplomat, I believe. And he, um, talked a lot about how in the democratic society, the politicians are always going to choose inflation. <laughs> They're not going to choose restraint. Oh, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's, it's like 
they 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 are designed to do so. So if our dem- democratic system has this fiat central banking model where there are no restraints, and what I'm describing is literally just history and fact, like they they will continue to run up a deficit. I mean, if especially if you're the reserve currency, I mean, look, our debt is now 31 trillion, 30 trillion, and you know, Fed's talking about raising rates. Well, guess what? They raise rates. I mean, if rates for every one percent in rates that they raise, um, you get another three hundred billion dollars that that we owe uh, in payments, right? This year, so <laughs> our federal budget's only six trillion. So <laughs> if we go up three percent, you're talking almost another trillion dollars of in- of payments, and this is this will literally bankrupt the country. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting to watch this all play out and. All of these things around CBDCs kind of come out of what I wrote, learned about and wrote about in the book because they dovetail those two themes that 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 neatly dovetail with 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 the Canadian truckers and and what we've seen with regard to the U.S. policy versus Russia and the sanctions, which is the micro and the macro, which is the Bitcoin as this like if, tool for individuals to fight back against repression, right, and to do protest money, let's say, okay. And the macro being this potentially new outside money, neutral digital reserve asset, right? So those were the two ideas that I was most taken by and fascinated by and, and, and puzzled by as I was writing the book and the chapters all moved through kind of both of those themes, the micro and and the macro. I can just say for, for people listening to this, uh, your first uh, person accounts and stories throughout the book are absolutely phenomenal. Just reading those first hand accounts is just like uh, I don't I don't know how to really describe it. It just it really put a uh, a face to this movement and just made it so real for me. And uh, when you start off the book, you have a title here, uh, some like subtitling in the start of the book, and the subtitling was just. When I read it, I just I just sat there and I'm like, this is such a powerful statement because it encapsulates so much of my day to day interactions on Twitter and people in this space are pretty much with Americans and people who live here stateside, right? Mm-hmm. I don't see the actual impact that this is having because so much of what uh, our conversations revolve around is an investing number go up discussion point. But this is the subtitle. You say, how financial privilege blinds dollar users to Bitcoin's importance. And I read that and I just thought to myself, my God, that is so true. And I tried to just kind of put myself in any other person around the world. And you you provide so many, you talk about Nigeria, Sudan, Ethiopia, you, you list all these countries um, throughout the book that you have done firsthand account interviews with people that are Bitcoiners in these nations and how, and their point of view. And my God, what a powerful read. I mean, it, it's phenomenal. So I guess in there, the question uh, for me is um, what account for you just sticks out in your head? Like first yeah. and foremost, as I ask that, like what person or which story or situation just kind of jumps out at you is just being a really powerful example of all of the, and I'm telling you folks, there's not one, there is, this book is just full of these accounts. Um, what do you got? Yeah. So for me, I think I'll say two, I'll say a general thing and then I'll mention someone specifically, but um, the collective when you when you breathe in the book, if you're able to 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 read, check your financial privilege and, and get a sense of what Preston's been talking about, um, which of course I'd be very grateful for and welcoming of your feedback. But um, I think the collective uh, TLDR is just like wow, humans are so persistent and resilient, and yeah, these people who are stuck in situations that are so unimaginably bad and so much worse than like someone like me could imagine and who are, I mean, I am so privileged, especially, especially financial, financially privileged, but, but all kinds of privileged over a lot of these folks. And they're able to find this 
hope in this new kind of money is just and 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 it's not like a geographic thing i've got chapters on togo and palestine and cuba and we, we go to nigeria we look at el salvador we, we 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 really go around and um i i afghanistan and, and i i you know we go to all the different continents and it's just really neat and fascinating that all these totally disparate people who literally have nothing to do with one another, they all have this common thing that they, uh, that has changed their life and gives them optimism for the future. And that to me is just like one of the big takeaways. It just made me so optimistic writing the book as for a specific person. Uh, one of the interviews that I started to do in 2020 was with my friend Roya Mahboub, who's one of Afghanistan's first female tech CEOs. And I'd actually known Roya for a while before I realized she used Bitcoin. Um, I think I met her in 2013 or 14, and it didn't really come up till a couple of years later when I was at an event with her and we're just chatting. And I just, it, somehow it, it, the word Bitcoin came up and she was like, oh yeah, you know, I've been using that for a while. And I'm kind of like, wait, what? Tell me more. And, you know, my story about her was, was I, I kind of got the chance to dust it off, go back and talk with her extensively and do a piece right around the fall of Kabul. This was like a few weeks after Kabul fell. So um, for me, it was a chance to go back and kind of get the message out about Roy, why, why she originally used it, which was so fascinating because, you know, she's in this society where women are either legally or socially sort of not permitted to use money at the same level as men. Um, the husbands, brothers, uncles of folks, you know, they take the cash when women come home, they, they don't, you can't really open bank accounts. I mean, you can, but it's discouraged, etc. cetera. Whatever's not illegal is, is sort of socially, you know, um, pushed back against. So she had this company that she started and I detail the whole story in the book, but was really amazing is, is called Citadel, <laughs> which is this uh, <laughs> theme in Bitcoin, right? So uh, I thought what was really funny about my interviews with her were that number one, her company was called Citadel, which is of course this, uh, you know, uh, kind of idea in Bitcoin of like where we're all going to live after the Bitcoin, after hyper, hyper Bitcoinization. But um, that's her company name. And the other thing was that she got her start building something called the Silk Road for the US government in Afghanistan, which of course I also thought was really funny. Um, but basically she starts hiring women to work for her and they're trying to figure out all these payment options and they've, they don't have an M-Pesa type thing in Afghanistan. All the FinTech that we use is censored. Their currency is you know, not doing so well over time. Um, so look, somebody points out Bitcoin to her. This was in like late 2012, I guess. Um, and she's like, she's got an open mind. She says, let's do it. So throughout like the spring and summer of 2013, the fall of 2013, they're like, she's paying these women in Bitcoin. And then like, it gives them the sense of financial freedom because they can actually own the asset and that they, she teaches them how to set up a wallet. They were of course much more rudimentary back then, but, but they worked basically the same way. And um, whenever the women wanted to spend, Roya's sister made like a side business of, uh, you know, buying uh, the Bitcoin back, you know, e either for, 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 for goods or, or for cash. Um, and uh, that's just this is like, like little ecosystem she built. And over time, like hundreds and even thousands of women and girls learned about this in this way. Um, now, of course, the, the crazy part of the story is that the Bitcoin price crashes at the end of 2013, like dramatically. So she has to make everybody whole. It's a huge setback. Everybody accuses her of being a crook. Like it, it's really, it, it makes you think about those early years when you literally were crazy for using it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. Bitcoin's risk was, was so high that no one took you seriously. I mean, today you and I can have these serious conversations because we have all this price history under our belt and, and people take it seriously because it is serious. It's a trillion dollar asset, et cetera. But back then it was not serious. So she risks it all. And afterwards, though, she can't like she can't shake it. She's like, there's something there that's so cool that we could have this money that 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 women could be equal in, like essentially that 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 does not discriminate based on gender. And um, she told two stories. She told me that I include there are first of all the fact that her sister 
that side hustle turned out to be very lucrative because she held on to the Bitcoin and she ended up paying for her education at Cornell with it, which was amazing. So that was like the first thing, all like this Bitcoin that these women earned ended up being like a huge treasure later on when they like, you know, saved it. And then this other person who worked for her fled the country, brought her Bitcoin with her, made it all the way to Germany, you know, across Iran, Turkey, the whole thing you know, boat flipping over, you know, the, hor the horrible stuff that Afghans have to go through to get to a better life, um, makes it to Germany, has brought the seed phrase with her, ends up having this nest egg, and in 2017 is able to sell some of it and, and start a new life in, in Germany. And that's where she is now. And like, these two stories, I thought were, were really something else. And, and the, the, the last thing I'll mention about that piece, which is, um, yeah, I just, I thought this Roya herself was, was the specific person that, that, remained in my mind as, as kind of the most interesting, uh, although all of the people I talked to were awesome and fascinating in different ways, was um, the fact that she had gone to Kabul uh, about a year ago and tried to convince her parents to buy some and to diversify into it. <laughs> and they were like, it wasn't like that they didn't believe her because because she became kind of world renowned for, for her work in this area. It was that they just were, you know, uncomfortable, procrastinating, and the, the craziest lesson is that they, they ended up not doing it. And then similarly to the way that when Putin invaded Ukraine, everybody was shocked. It was like a, kind of a surprise. Like you saw all those things on social that I saw. People were hanging out in Kiev partying like until yeah. the day it happened. Yeah. Similar like to, I mean, people knew that the army was coming, the Taliban were coming, but like it was extremely sudden. Right. And her parents had to flee. And guess what? couldn't bring their savings with them. So she's, she, she has this regret that she wasn't able to su sufficiently persuade them to do this because had they just diversified a little bit to Bitcoin, they could have brought some of their, their wealth with them. And, and that's a theme that I've seen all across uh, all the writing I've done is like, and, and, and stories that didn't make it into the book that will be maybe for a future book about Syria, Venezuela, other places, like what a powerful Ukraine. thing. Yeah. Now, and now Ukraine, I mean, there was a great CNBC piece, out there um, by uh, one of the journalists there, Mackenzie, who's Sigalos. She's been really, really great on the Bitcoin beat lately. Um, and I talked to her a lot, that story gave her some sources and she ended up writing about a young guy who fled uh, Ukraine with 40% of his life savings um, intact. Uh, whereas most people, you know, lost everything. Um, and um, that, that idea of like refugee money is, is extremely powerful. Um, so anyway, I thought that story was, was a big takeaway for me in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, to me, the, the Cuba and the Palestine pieces were the ones I went the deepest and they were, they were, I knew a lot about those two areas, but I, I, I learned so much in doing the research and writing this, like each piece is very long and detailed and covers a lot of history about each, because I felt like it was so important to have a nuanced view. Um, and I really, really, changed my own mind about a lot of things as I, as I wrote those pieces. Um, and I just, it's two very different scenarios, but, you know, two situations where people are trapped, you know, between two kind of almost external forces, like in both cases, they have the local corrupt government, whether that be the Cuban dictatorship or the Palestinian authority. And then they have this like foreign presence, the, whether it be the Israeli, the IDF or the U S and the U S embargo, and both of them are putting this pressure on them and, and, and hurting their ability to do commerce and to save and transact and to enjoy the things that you and I have as privileged Americans. And I just thought that the dichotomy of both of those stories was quite powerful. So I, I, I definitely am very proud of those two chapters as well, especially just given that, like, I mean, such a Bitcoin is just badass. Like it's like, it's like this one thing that they can like say, I'm going to use this and I don't care what you have to say. And I, in one of the women I interviewed in the, you know, Cuba chapter, it's like, I found her on like Max and Stacy's like telegram group. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's amazing, but she's, she's now doing well. She got in in early 2020 and she's doing well enough now that she's like supporting one of her family members in America, like, you know, with wow. Bitcoin, which is, she's like a, you know, Cuban middle class, meaning extremely poor medical worker who works for the state in that country. And she just was stacking sats and learned about it that way. And uh, everybody can do that. And it just gives me a lot of hope. So, yeah, I mean, the book covers a lot of ground. Um, 
90% of coffee that you buy from the grocery store is actually stale. You heard that right. The coffee you know and you think you love needs an upgrade. Instead of buying the same old, same old, let Trade Coffee send you something freshly roasted that you are literally guaranteed to love. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans in America from the best coffee roasters. They ship for free to you as often as you like, whole or ground. My favorite thing about Trade Coffee is the quiz. You simply go on the website, you answer a few questions. It's super simple and quick. And then they actually recommend a bag of coffee that they think you'll love. And I guarantee you they'll be right. They recently sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee. And usually I put honey in my coffee, but this time I think I could drink it actually black because it's so smooth and delicious. I absolutely loved it. One of the other major benefits is that they ship you the coffee in a compostable bag. So you can literally bury your coffee in the bag that they ship it in. Their subscription is no hassle. You can skip shipments, change the frequency, or cancel at any time. Right now, Trade is offering a total of $20 off your first three bags when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 16 cups of coffee for free. To get started, take their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and start your journey to the perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $20 off your first three bags. I, I was speaking of ahead. covering yeah. speaking of covering a lot of ground. Um, one of the sections of the book that I was just thoroughly impressed with. This is not a topic that I've ever covered on the show before. At least I don't think I have. Um, you talk a little bit and you write about the birth of the cypherpunk movement mm-hmm. and how it was the seeds uh, into Bitcoin. And you talk about uh, interviewing Adam and you cover the whole cast of characters that were part of the cypherpunk movement. Can you cover a little bit of this research uh, with my audience and just kind of give them a background of of how this all kind of sprung out of that movement and the time frame? This happened decades ago, mm-hmm. but give them kind of an idea of of when this really kind of started kicking off and a little bit of the backstory because I don't think that we've ever t- covered this on on our show. Yeah, so I think you know I tried to set up the book with a couple, as you say, kind of immediate characters to, to show you people who are using Bitcoin around the world in ways that might surprise you. And then I tried with chapter two to, to, to bring it back to like, before those people even had thought about a money that their government doesn't, yeah. didn't control, there was a whole group of folks working towards providing that tool for humanity. And they were the cypherpunks. And you, look, the research uh, goes through a, a lot of books, writing that was done in the, in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. And there's a veritable treasure trove of, of reportage from Wired Magazine from the 90s that's so phenomenal on this, especially by this guy, Stephen Livy, Livy. But like Wired Magazine in the 90s was amazing. Like if you read this stuff, it's like so, so cool. I mean, they, they were living a similar moment to what we're living now. And what's funny is, of course, Adam Beck, I asked him about this and he's like, oh, today's like way crazier than then because he was like a frontline <laughs> soldier in the crypto wars in the 90s. And I mean, now it's like even more, way more wild. But at the time, um, yeah, I mean, again, I think w- what you had was this collective realization that as things digitized in society and as especially communications and money became electronic, that that was going to open up new paths for governments to surveil and control people, um, especially in, in conjunction with, with large corporations. And cypherpunks wrote extensively about this. And one of the characters in, in that story is David Chom, who I had the pleasure of meeting and hanging out with one day uh, a few years ago, um, just kind of spending the day with him and just talking to him about, about his, his life and what he's up to. But, you know, he was one of the first who really, really saw the need for not just encrypted communications, but encrypted money. And essentially like in the seventies, scientists came up with ways for two individuals to trade a secret on the internet. This was done out of research at Stanford university. um, And it was really, really groundbreaking. Um, But, you know, this sort of, you know, concept to practice takes time. And actually it took about 15 years to get from, uh, the sort of uh, what we would call like the the RSA uh, paper based on Whit- Whitfield and Diffie's work around public key encryption in the mid seventies to 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 having an actual device that could allow you, me and you to have uh, essentially an encrypted message uh, online and and that obviously was um, you know PGP uh, so the PGP project uh, and Phil Zimmerman right um, pretty good privacy. 
uh, you know, that was that that kind of came out in the early 90s, but it was built on the back of all this stuff by all these academics who, who had been exploring these issues, David Chom, not least among them. And you look at you read, you go back, you read his stuff from the 80s and 90s, and he he knew it. He was like, look, this is going to be this Orwellian state. We got to stop it. Um, and they, they knew back then. And, and basically the cypherpunk movement is that is sort of the validation of um, a realization that there's two ways to protect our rights. We can ask the government for them, or we can seize them ourselves through open source code. And, and this is always what I'm thinking about today with these debates around CBDCs, FedCoin, whatever, like back then, yeah, you could like go to the US government. I mean, it's same characters. I mean, Clinton was, was president, Senator Biden was very involved in cracking down on, on, fr on free speech on the internet and on encryption. Same, same people that are, that are leading our country today back then did not want Americans to have privacy on the internet for the same reasons that they don't want us to have Bitcoin today. Whatever, child porn, terrorism, crime, they, they make up anything. They, they just didn't want to give up the power, right? They wanted the clipper chip. They wanted a device in every American's, you know, consumer technology, you know, piece of equipment that would allow them to have like basically a, a, a key into, into, into the private messages. So I think what was so interesting is, is just seeing the cypherpunk ethos is that, no, we're just going to go ahead and seize our rights with open source code. Um, and, and, and ask for uh, forgiveness and not, and not permission. And that was essential. I mean, they had to do that because you weren't going to lobby your way into freedom back then. And you're not going to do it today either. And that's why I think Bitcoin is so important. Like we're not going to be able to like, <laughs> there's a lot of these people who a lot of them I respect, you know, they think that we can convince the government to make like private cash. Like there's just a lot of reasons why that's not going to work. And, and, and I think I was inspired by the cypherpunks and that they, they saw that this was such a kind of existential threat. And, you know, after, after kind of making it possible to have encrypted messaging, which was kind of like the first battle, the war or like the Holy grail, I guess was, was eCash. And, and it was this thing that had always been talked about in sci-fi writing. Again, Neil Stevenson, his books were so formative for a lot. I think a lot of these people, and you go back and reason did a really good, kind of video series on the cypherpunk early years, but you look at these people like Tim May, uh, John Gilmore, the other folks, um, you know, Eric Hughes, uh, the cypherpunk manifesto, like all this stuff, they, they got together in the early nineties and they decided, you know, we're, we're, we're going to fight back. And Adam back was part of that. And Adam back was, um, you know, it was no coincidence that he was the first person to get an email from Satoshi Nakamoto. Like he had, decades of experience in distributed systems and um, cyber money. Like he, he was very much a part of that. And so my essay, you know, my, my second chapter in the book goes through all these characters and we learn about what, you know, David Chom and what he tried to do with DigiCash and why it failed. And then kind of people like um, Adam Back and Wei Dai and, um, and, and, and others uh, kind of, uh, Nick Sabo kind of like looking at why it failed and then kind of get this realization that I, I felt was lacking in the genre of, um, although at Aaron, uh, from Bitcoin magazine, um, Von Wirdem has done a really good job describing this as well. Um, that it wasn't just about the privacy piece. Like we need to remember that Satoshi did not unveil Bitcoin after a surveillance scandal like a Snowden files, he or she, whoever it was, unveiled Bitcoin after the great financial crisis and after government bailouts of banks and after moral hazard was established. And, you know, I think that you know, it's very powerful that they choose um, to like kind of integrate 6102 and the executive order 6102, which made holding gold illegal in America into kind of these key numbers in the Bitcoin code and that they chose a birthday of April 5th, which was the date that FDR issued that order. And like all this stuff about monetary history is just sort of littered throughout Bitcoin. And it really gives you the clues that you need to understand, not least the Genesis block and Chancellor on the brink of bailout of banks. You know, again, that, that Bitcoin was, was not just about eCash and the title of the white paper, right? It was not just about privacy. It was about that. And the cypherpunks, that's obviously kind of where they started. But you, 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 you get this kind of realization from Adam and others that what was really essential was to actually create a money system that, that, that the government didn't control. That was a decentralized mint, as Adam puts it. And that's what Satoshi figured out. So you can kind of see in Satoshi's work that 
they were standing on the shoulders of these like cypherpunk giants who, who fought for free speech on the internet, but also that they had seen what happened to gold and how it got killed as a money and how the US government basically managed to defeat it and, and replace it with its own debt as the world reserve currency. That, that, that clearly was on the mind of these folks. Um, and, you know, again, Satoshi long, uh, you know, sits at the end of a long line of them, um, but they all contributed. And at the end of the day, I thought what was so powerful was that, um, you know, it's really a monetary innovation and not necessarily like a technological uh, innovation. And that really my thesis essentially of, the, of the, that chapter is that I don't think you could have had Bitcoin or a decentralized money w- without the, the, the kind of the monetary policy focus, like the 21 million piece yeah. is like what makes everything else possible. Yeah. So that's, I loved, I just loved going through all that history and, and doing that, that piece with Adam was great to get a lot of his time to be able to just learn about all these interesting things that he did when he was younger. I mean, it's like completely amazing. I mean, it's, it's meringue. It, it really puts on a showcase of, uh, you know, if there was one person or this was multiple people, the amount of foresight, research, knowledge um, that, that was there with like just the hints that you were talking about that are embedded into a lot of this stuff. And I mean, that is just at the <laughs> as surface level as you can get compared to everything else that's underneath the hood that's going on. It's just, it's miraculous. Yeah. And, and you really get a sense, especially from Hal Finney, um, who, you know, it's, Hal Finney worked at DigiCash, you know, it's, or rather he, uh, Nick, Nick Saba worked at DigiCash, but Hal, what I was trying to say is Hal worked at um, PGP. Like Hal was one of the yeah. first contributors to Phil Zimmerman. And they were all part of this community that they were fighting the surveillance state, you know, but yeah. Hal and others realized that to really to fight the surveillance state, you got to fight central banking. That's what they realized. This is kind of this yeah, astonishing conclusion, which most people just would have completely missed, I think. Yeah. And still to this day, the like digital liberties activist groups in the world are just not tuned into like why fiat central banking is a problem. Like that's just not on their radar at all. And, you know, we can thank, we thank God that Satoshi figured this out, but like, it wasn't just him or her, or whoever it was, it was, it was many people who through trial and error, you know, figured this out, but Hal especially knew, you know, you can, you can see that he, he kind of took some of Nick's ideas about Bitgold and married them with some of Dai's ideas. And he had his reusable proof of work thing in 04, which was really the last big innovation before Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, I mean, he, you know, what a legend. I mean, dude, he was running Bitcoin in, right away. Um, and unbelievable. Within a few days was like, oh, this could be worth like a $10 million. <laughs> yeah, that's like the posts. I know the posts. It, no, the bo- it's, it's I love amazing. this book. Uh, the book of Satoshi is we're talking about books Yeah, um, that goes into all the old posts. And um, uh, just you can go back and you can read what these guys were saying at, at the Genesis block at, at that point in time. And it's just miraculous. The accuracy of of their foresight is just unbelievable. Yeah, and, and now a big thing in Bitcoin today is, and to which of course Hal kind of predicted. He he's like, look, in the future, I think it's going to be Bitcoin banks, and Bitcoin will be the reserve currency, and we'll all use these like you know, sort of yeah. let's say paper paper Bitcoin or fiat instruments on top of the bit. And you know what? Like, I think you got to at this point say that that's definitely a possible scenario for where we're headed. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of foresight there. But I, I wanted that to be like the right there at the beginning of the book to help the audience understand kind of socially, politically, where did this thing come from? This tool that all these people are now using all around the world, where did it come from and and why was it created? Um, And then to then marry that, I go right in from that chapter, right into the chapter about the petrodollar and, and just to think about like monetary history. Which is Um, phenomenal, by the way, which is if people have not, um, I, I want to ask one other, believe it or not, Alex, we're already at an hour. <laughs> um, the petrodollar piece of yeah. your book is phenomenal. I would, I would make the argument for people that uh, maybe are not intimately familiar with, with how it arose, what it means, more importantly, what it means for like uh, policy decisions and policy trends that we've seen over the past four decades. Um, what a what an amazing piece inside the book, uh, just to kind of understand all of those dependencies and trajectory that kind of came out of that. The thing that um, I know you get hit up a lot about 
mm-hmm. uh, transitioning and pivoting here yeah. uh, that you that you get hit a lot by um, is in the privacy space uh, for people mm-hmm. that's that look at Bitcoin and they say there's better privacy solutions. And uh, as a person that works in human rights, we think that you, Alex Gladstein, should be a, a much bigger proponent for the other solutions that are out there. You have a you have a, a, a chapter in your book that's titled "Talk to" uh, uh, that's titled uh, "Bitcoin's Privacy Problem." Um, tell mm-hmm. us tell us your thoughts here, and, and give us a little insight into the way that you view this. Yeah, well, I I think. Again, a lot of this was colored by my talks with Adam back and other cypherpunks, but there were kind of, there are kind of two ways to approach eCash. One is to focus on privacy, and one one is to focus on on basically monetary policy. And I think Adam and 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 I and many others agree that Satoshi made the right call, focused first and foremost on monetary policy, on like creating a predictable, credible monetary policy that the whole world could appreciate and understand quite easily. And that had an incentive structure that would protect it over time as more and more people joined it, as opposed to got corrupted over time, which is what would happen in like a proof of stake type scenario. So um, I think that one of the interesting things Adam mentioned to me is that he was glad that he didn't tell Satoshi about this, like one particular paper that was kind of focused on zero knowledge proofs, which which would later give rise to Zcash. Uh, uh, and the reason why is because it would have made Bitcoin too bulky. Like these, these like at least let's say up until now, these kind of you know highly highly encrypted transactions are just larger in terms of just the information that they carry. And one of the key 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 things about Bitcoin, um, and I've mentioned it in different places in the book, but um, it, is that essentially there, there was this, there's been obviously a tension over the, over the years. It's largely over now, but th- there was definitely a, a really existential moment in Bitcoin history, 2015 to 2017, where there was essentially a fight over, over, um, how, how kind of big the blocks would be in Bitcoin. And this, this all has to do with this idea of like being able to run the Bitcoin software at home or, or having to trust a, a server somewhere else to do it. And I think that Adam knew even then that like if you kind of focused on privacy tech at the base, it would make the transactions really big and people wouldn't really be able to run the software at home to verify for themselves everything. And they'd have to trust somebody else because that you'd need very specialized hardware to do this. Um, and that was the right decision to focus on like making things so that anybody could operate Bitcoin at home. And that ne- that necessitated like you know vulnerabilities and privacy. Like again, Bitcoin pseudonymous. Obviously, we know all about chain analysis and how if you're not careful, like somebody can just watch what's happening. But I think the right call was made in terms of like we can we can we can develop privacy as we go. And of course, the people who create other alternative cryptocurrencies that focus on privacy would argue the opposite. But hey, I mean, you know, my, my general take as to why I, I think the most important thing is to help privacy in Bitcoin. There, there's two reasons. Number one, I just don't think that these altcoins are going to last. Like I just, they're, they might be useful tools today. Sure. And you see that you see like Samurai wallet allowing its users to, to, to do swaps with Monero. Okay. Well, like maybe it can be a useful tool today, but who knows what it's going to be like in a year or two years. Um, we, we just don't know. And the thing is some of these, privacy coins are going to get basically canceled from, from exchanges. Like that's what happens. Like, you know, they like, like how many exchanges except Monero, which I think most kind of cypherpunk types would say would be like the most legitimate privacy coin. The answer is not very many. Um, And there's a reason for that because, you know, law enforcement is like, not so sure about Monero. Right. Okay. So it doesn't really pass the KYC AML regime and exchanges aren't really interested in that fight. Right. Um, but guess what? Bitcoin can't be canceled. <laughs> you can't cancel Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency exchange operator, right? It's like the whole reserve asset of the whole system. So, so there's this approach that I think people like Greg Maxwell had where they basically said, look, we're just going to over time add privacy. And you know, if Bitcoin had debuted as Monero, um, 
would it even would, have survived? Would it have survived? You wouldn't have been able to roll the the horse into the yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so it it starts out um very imperfect, but man, we're getting there. Like you can and and it's look, it's not to the point where a oligarch can can do, you know, trillions, billions of dollars or even a hundred million dollars and get away with it. This is one of the reasons why um I, I think I've seen a lot of, of interesting stuff on um, you know, sanctions and Bitcoin, but just yeah, to I've be, seen just, yeah, there's yeah, just to be just to be are... brief on it. Bitcoin's really good for like the masses, and you can actually privately use bit like you can use the Lightning Network, and you can use free and open source wallets, and you can withdraw Bitcoin from Cash App via Lightning to a Moon Wallet, for example, and you can tip somebody. And the privacy there is extremely strong. Like sending Lightning in Bitcoin has very good privacy right now. Um, so there are ways to achieve privacy pretty simply. Um, but but you can't do $100 million in Lightning, right? So it's like, it's kind of limited to kind of like daily interactions and like smaller things. The the bigger you get in Bitcoin in terms of size and and, and you have that need to convert it into dollars or, or different currency, that's where you're going to get caught, right? So that's why it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense for Russian oligarchs to use because all of those on-ramps and off-ramps are tightly policed. And that's why these like Bitfinex thieves got, caught right they, they, they were getting caught in the liquidation process now it's a different world maybe preston in 10 20 years when we, we could buy big stuff everything with bitcoin now that's a different world but we're not there yet and today we are where we are so i think that the right move was to develop bitcoin's privacy slowly over time and it's really getting there i think in the next couple of years it's 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 really going to get there and I think that I, I just think our energies are best spent. This is our best shot. This is our one best shot. So, you know, why not the altcoin, you know, the privacy altcoins? Because we should all be focusing on Bitcoin because it's our best shot. Like I, for all the cool stuff that the Monero people have done, Monero is not going to become the re neutral reserve asset of the world. It's, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So Bitcoin could do that though. And it could really be the standard for everybody. I also just think that like, Bitcoin mining is such an important part of what big, makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, and all these other alt um, altcoin privacy uh, tokens are, are all moving to a proof of stake thing. So I think they're moving away from like the proof of work thing, which is such such a critical part of Bitcoin. So at the end of the day, uh, I, I I think that there's a lot of really good reasons to just kind of focus on Bitcoin privacy. Um, but hey, yeah, if, if you need to use something like Monero, I mean, go for it. I mean, there's risks with all these things, but. I'm really excited about where we're going with Bitcoin, Bitcoin privacy. And obviously so is Adam back. I mean, he invented Blockstream or launched it literally to try to make Bitcoin more private. And you know what? Mm -hmm. He yeah. has, he has mm -hmm. Blockstream has done a lot of work on lightning. It's done a lot of work on liquid and confidential transactions. And he continues on his quest and, and I think we should continue on ours. Yeah. I've got kind of a, a, not a Bitcoin specific question. So I recently read this book, uh, Red Handed. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the book or not, but in general, it goes around and it talks about uh, all the perverted incentives uh, that have matured in the past two decades, I would say, uh, between China and all of these people in charge uh, running from Wall Street to uh, academia, definitely on the politics side, it covers both both political parties, and how, and, and it covers uh, in Canada with Trudeau and uh, just all of these people that are leading all of these various facets of society, and how they're moving towards this socialist dictator-like uh, power, where they they. I don't want to say that they are that they're all for it, but they're they're much more accommodative or sympathetic to it. I think is probably the better word. They're sympathetic to it. Mm -hmm. We saw this with uh, Charlie Munger recently talking about it. You see a lot of Ray Dalio's comments. You see, um, and I'm, I could just go on and on. And the book mm -hmm. is, I walked away from reading this book and just disgusted. Like absolutely disgusted, and meaning, I guess meaning meaning more about like the corporate complicity with China, or more about the general yeah. sort of trust in centrally planned systems, which, which is the a little bit of both, a little a, bit of both, a, yeah. a little bit of both, and just uh, what I just don't understand how people that have been 
the, uh, the beneficiaries of a free and open system for so many decades, right, could basically be turning their back on the thing that supplied them with all of this, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word power, but it might not be the right uh, terminology. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're looking at a, a system in China of just this, this total control, this absolute communist control. And almost, uh, and Zuckerberg was also uh, talked about in the book, um, where they're, they're almost admiring it. And I don't understand what's driving that. What, what do you think? Because at the end of the day, it's all about centralization and control. It's like absolute control. How, how, what is driving so many people that are controlling the world today to be promoting this or, it's or very sympathizing? Ho- it's with very it? Hobbesian. It's, it's very Leviathan, right? It's like uh, order and chaos, right? And they're, yeah. they're feeling that, that their society is, is breaking down and they're looking at this um, – Kind it's of, the um, it's the whole WEF narrative. It's it's yeah. the people at the WEF, you know the the World Economic Forum for people that aren't familiar with the yeah. Term. No, no, I just mean that like the the people who are starting to suck up to China or or started to portray it in a good light um, are taken by this idea of order and order being most important, and that like mm. we just you know mm. our families need order, and the most important thing is like enough food to survive and and just social order as opposed to freedom and innovation and disruption like that that's 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 where they're trending and there are things that make them feel that way um and that's very unfortunate and i think that the again the cool part is that we have this like uniting global technology that's being developed by people all over the world that's uh that's the total opposite. That, that and they that, see that, that as chaos. <laughs> they, they see that they as see chaos. chaos. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's there's no better tell of what Bitcoin is than the fact that the CCP banned Bitcoin infrastructure right before its hundredth annual uh, anniversary last summer. I mean, it 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 fears Bitcoin. There's no bigger tell of what Bitcoin is than than the fact that Putin didn't incorporate it into his like post sanction plan. He's working with gold and, and India and China and he's working, control. With, he's working on <laughs> he's working on the fact that he knows that the West will basically allow him to keep making his bond payments and and to to, to you know keep selling his oil. But um he he did not incorporate Bitcoin. And there's a reason. He's afraid of it. He's unsure mm. about it. He doesn't it's not good for tyrants. Like it's not not, no. not great for centrally central planning. And um and not great for statism. And, and I think it's good for humans, though, and it's good for open societies. And, and one, of, one of my chapters in the book talks about how I, I think it just resonates with American values. And I don't mean the American experiment, how it's played out. And I don't mean slavery and what happened and genocide and with the Native Americans. And I, I don't mean all those things. What I mean are the founding ideals, uh, the sort of Jeffersonian and, and kind of uh, ideals of, of the original Declaration of Independence and the ideas that made America powerful and that still make it for all of our warts, like a place where a lot of people want to come to obviously. Right. And that still leads the world in a lot of ways. And I think that that is, is really important because those ideals are things like free speech, property rights, and open capital markets. And that's what Bitcoin represents. And that's not going to work for the CCP. They can't have free speech, property rights, and open capital markets. The yuan will never be a reserve currency because it can't be fully open. It can't be fully convertible because they can't have that. They, they need control. So I, I just love the way it kind of sets us up for the next decade where it pits like different styles of governance against each other. <laughs> I think it's going to be really, really interesting to watch. Um, and it makes me bullish about America. Like I think that uh, America can be very, we talked about this before, but I mean, I, America can be, can really d- dig in and resonate uh, with Bitcoin. And look, it may, look, it may, it may be the thing that secedes the dollar system. And, and there are things there that, that are going to change our lives for sure. But I think for the better over time, um, I think for the better over time, for sure. I thought one of the more interesting things that Jack Dorsey said in his recent interview with Michael Saylor was uh, at the beginning of their chat in February was that um, he thought it was unfair that um, like basically a handful of people in Washington get this, get to set the price of money uh, and the rules for money for the people in Nigeria. And he just thought that was just a broken system. And that's just very deep. Like that's what is profound about yeah. like 
all the things I learned about when I wrote Check Your Financial Privileges. How did that happen? How did that come to be? And how are people fighting back against that? Um, and that's what Jack's obviously dedicating his career to um, with Be Trust and and Spiral and everything he's doing at Block. You can really kind of see it. Um, writings on the wall that that he thinks a neutral system would be better. Um, and that, I, I totally uh, agree. And um, yeah, when you think about checking one's financial privilege, like, yeah, I mean, we are very, very privileged for a variety of reasons. And our government is too. I mean, they can just freeze. I mean, what? No other superpower has that ability of just like, oh, we're just going to freeze your savings just to do that. Like, yeah. and, and when we do it, we spend our power down and we can't ever do that again in the same way. And um, I, 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 I think that a, a world where there's a reserve currency that's neutral is, is ultimately going to result in actually a, a more fair world. Um, but one thing I want to mention before we, before, before we break is that I also coincidentally got the pleasure of writing a forward to a different book, uh, which just came out called Bitcoin is Venice by Alan Farrington and Sasha Myers, which honestly is my, um, the best book on Bitcoin that I've read personally. Um, it's just an extraordinary work about the past and future of capitalism. And I would really encourage people to read it. Mm. It's super, super deep and really mind blowing. And um, the chapters in it are just so brilliant. And the authors bring so much, um, uh, they bring so many different perspectives from so many different kinds of thinkers, from communists and Marxists all the way over to Austrians. To, they just kind of, they really sweep uh, the last several hundred years of, of thinking into this book. And they talk a lot about the things that we know are true. Like the fact that this is not capitalism is one of their chapters. And like what would you and I go out and we see is not capitalism. I mean, it's all rigged. I mean, everything is polit politically controlled, right? Um, like obviously the fed is not capital, like it's not capitalist for to set the price of money is not, it's not capitalist. Right. So they, they go into all this stuff and they have this incredibly powerful chapter on energy and Bitcoin, which I think everybody needs to read. And it just opens with this chart, which shows so powerfully the 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 per capita electricity use of countries in the world, uh, and 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 their uh, in their in and their income essentially. And it's so obvious and clear that the more advanced countries use more electricity per capita. This is a very important thing for us to reflect on. Like, yeah, guess who doesn't use a lot of electricity? Guess who has a low carbon footprint? Burundi. Okay. So like, it's very clear that as we advance as a civilization, we're going to use more energy. This is such an important point. And their chapter in that book on energy and the environment and Bitcoin is, is the single best one I've read. And it, I mean, they basically make the assertion that, um, that if you're an environmentalist, you have to support Bitcoin. And, and I think they back it up. It's, it's really, really well done. I've, I literally ordered this book while we, while you were saying, this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And I'll, I'll just, I'll, I, I wanted to just read this one little tiny thing from it. Yeah, uh, please. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, I thought this was beautiful, but, uh, th this is, um, their thesis. It's just one paragraph. And, um, their whole thing is that Venice, as you know, or as you may know, uh, was kind of this break from the European feudal structure of society where you had lords and serfs, essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Venice really broke that. It was this time and place where like capitalism came out and meritocracy came out and cosmopolitan commerce and trade. It, you know, it was not really built on a military might. It was built on ideas, right? It's a super powerful thing. So they, they basically assert that today we're in like a neo-feudal system, that that, that mm -hmm. kind of menace has came back essentially. And that their thesis is that, that, that some parts of society can avoid collapse by embracing Bitcoin. And they say that we are sure it seems hyperbolic to most, if not outright ludicrous, <laughs> but it's actually fairly prosaic. It means that those social units that voluntarily choose to embrace Bitcoin, a global digital sound open source programmable money, will be in a position to accumulate long-term oriented capital at a disproportionate rate to those who do not. They will have a superior economic foundation from which to build healthy social and political institutions, which will contrast to those left behind as medieval Venice did to the remnants of the Western empire. This is the thesis of the book in a nutshell. Shell. And I just thought that that was so powerful and delighted that they asked me to do the forward. And um, the, uh, just, the Bitcoin has just become the, the future capital yeah. allocators to rebuild the, the new no, system. No, no, 100%. And I'll just read this one other sentence that, um, you know, 
they, they actually, you know, they, again, they believe that um, this rebooted feudalism that we live under, they believe that there's, there's Bitcoin's like this sprout coming up and it, it's this new model. Um, and they believe that in the book, they go through a variety of reasons why they think people around the world will be able to avoid feudalism through Bitcoin. Um, and they have this sentence, which really hit me in the feels where it says, you know, we think for some but we hope for many and we pray for all. And I just think that, that is, that's so powerful. Like that, that's, that's what I think what we're doing out here. I mean, obviously you yeah. spend a lot of time educating people about Bitcoin, talking to them, talking to them about it. I think that's the feeling, right? Like we all know where this is going and we hope, we hope that like people listen, but we pray for everybody. I mean, that's we right. really want everybody to be in this thing before the day comes when mm -hmm. the big squeeze happens mm -hmm. and we all that's going to happen at some point. It's going to read like some freaking science fiction book, but there'll be a big squeeze where in a matter of 72 hours, all of a sudden the world changes. once in a millennia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we want to get everybody in <laughs> before yeah. then that we care about. And that's, that's our quest, right? So we do what we can and hopefully my book uh, will, will contribute to the ability of people to do so uh, and to convince and to just, just dialogue with people who have fallen prey to this, uh, like just pounding narrative from the mainstream media and governments that, that Bitcoin is dangerous and risky and extremists and criminal and all these things. And hopefully it'll show that, that, um, that's just not the case and that it's just this powerful humanitarian tool. That's a liberation technology and that we should not want to short it we should want to invest in it. I mean, for yeah. the good of everybody. So I would say that's the, that's the, that's the TLDR, but I'm um, just very grateful for you uh, giving me the oh, opportunity to come on and talk about this stuff. It's been really, really fun. Yeah. My pleasure, Alex. What a, what an honor to have you here. And uh, I can tell you phenomenal book, your research, your ability to humanize stories and make Bitcoin way bigger then number go up <laughs> because it is, it is so much bigger. This is, this is just, uh, this is, uh, I think a little bit beyond words and, and not even remotely compre comprehensible to people today as to what this thing is. And yeah. uh, for me, your, your book has just done a, a phenomenal job of, of uh, just highlighting a lot of the stuff that, especially for an American and maybe a person in a very developed uh, economy um, doesn't see they, they, they are totally warped by what it is that they use and what they have access to on a daily basis. And I don't think they realize what so many people on this planet <laughs> don't have and what aren't what they're seeing from their vantage point. Your book does such a phenomenal job doing that. So um Feel free to highlight anything else that you're working on or whatever, and uh, we'll wrap it up from there. But uh, thanks so much for making time and, and coming on, Alex. Thank you. No, this was this was great. Uh, no, I, I'll see a lot of you all hopefully in Miami in a few weeks. Um, I'll be speaking on the uh, main stage with three of my dearest friends, uh, Yomi Park, uh, an incredible North Korean who. Yes, you know, I follow her. She's awesome. I mean, she wrote In Order to Live and had the most dramatic escape and just as one of the bravest and most persistent people in the world. Uh, Amazing. She's gotten to tell her story on Rogan and all kinds of other places. So I get to be with her. She has some really interesting thoughts on Bitcoin, which I'm excited to share uh, with the world. And my friend Farida Naburema, who is a character in my book, actually, who's from a country that is still ruled by the French colonial uh, currency system. And she, used, she kind of views Bitcoin as a currency of decolonization, which I find so fascinating. So we're going to talk about that. And then my friend Fadi from Palestine, from the West Bank, and he, he again is a character in the book. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, wh why he's optimistic about, about this technology and how it, how it like meaningfully and measurably improves the lives of people in Palestine. So we get to do that uh, panel, which I'm really jazzed about. I think they have us between Peter Thiel and Salinas. So I, hopefully we'll have a full uh, awesome. full room, which will be good. But we'll see you guys awesome. there. And then the Oslo, I just want, well, I'll tease the Oslo Freedom Forum, um, which is going to go down at the end of May in Norway. And it's a, it's a freedom conference. It's a human rights conference, but we're going to have an amazing financial freedom track 
sponsored by CT. Uh, and we're going to have just a variety of killer speakers um, ranging from a lot of the people that I've talked about in my book who are Bitcoin advocates from authoritarian countries and emerging markets. Um, people like uh, Abu Bakr, Noor Khalil, who's on Jack Dorsey's B-Trust board um, from Nigeria, uh, to Leonid Volkov, who's Navalny's right-hand man and the person who's been intimately involved with raising tons of Bitcoin over the years for, for the Russian opposition movement. Um, and then we're going to like bring them together with, with some of the more prominent folks in our space, like whether it be Jack Mahlers or Lynn Alden or Jeff Booth or Elizabeth Stark, uh, Matt O'Dell, et cetera. We have a really killer speaker lineup. So I'm really, really excited about that event. So folks can go to oslofreedomforum.com and, and sign up today if they want to, if they want to join us. And we'll also have a live stream if you want to tune in at home. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to show that too. We'll put links in the show notes for yeah. all of that. And also for Alex's uh, book and Alex, thank you for making time. This was phenomenal. Thanks for having me, Preston. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 